Uh, so hi, I'm Lance Yolanoff, I'm Manager Chief of Mashable, and uh, we're here to talk about the future of global broadband. Uh, sitting uh, directly to my right is uh, Mr. Hans Vestberg, who's the President and CEO of Ericsson. And over there is Dr. Hamadoun Toure, Secretary General of ITU, or International Telecommunications Union. So, uh, kind of obviously, everybody knows what broadband is, uh, and you're probably all on it right now. Although I think, yeah, you were told to switch, right, Wi-Fi to broadband, uh, <laughs> and hopefully you all did that. So, uh, what we'd like to do is just uh, very quickly, kind of the state. Each of you tell us in a short period of time the state of global broad broadband, and uh, we can start with Hans. Uh, thank you. I think the whole conference or this uh, social good summit's all about global digital action, and. Uh, I think that the first thing I really want to say that is the pace of technology change will never be as slow as it is right now. Everything we're looking for will be much faster, much speedier. Today, 6.3 billion mobile subscriptions in the world, 1 billion mobile broadband subscriptions in the world. That's just going to blow the next five years. 2017. 5 billion mobile broadband subscriptions. That means that we want to triplicate the amount of people having access to internet. I think that's why we're here, to discuss that enabler, how we can use that for transformation. The technology that can transform education, healthcare, uh, CO2 emission, etc. And I think that's really where we see the platform going. And, and I was happy to hear that you're switching from Wi-Fi to 3G as 40% uh, of all mobile traffic in the world is going through Ericsson network and 50% of all smartphone traffic is going through our networks as well. So we're happy to switch for 3G. It's like the world in microcosm. <laughs> Absolutely. <right here. laughs> uh, so uh, Hamadun, what's well, your perspective? As you know, two thirds of the world population are still not connected. Well, you are privileged in this room here. Uh, you are all connected. And we need to make sure that all the world's inhabitants are connected to the goodies of the online world, which means better healthcare, better education, more sustainable economic and social development. We are launching tomorrow at our Broadband Commission, and Hans and I are both members of the Broadband Commission, which I've cre I created uh, in 2010 with the Director General of UNESCO. Uh, we're launching the state of the broadband world tomorrow and we are giving a set of recommendations in which uh, every country has to call on so that they could be able to give access to their citizens. Access to broadband is not simply, not, uh, not simply having a fast internet connection. It's a set of transformative lifestyle life-changing uh, devices and uh, services that we're looking at here. So we need to make, make sure that uh, not only all the world's people are connected, no matter how, no matter what circumstances they are in, no matter whether they are from develop or developing countries, or no matter, regardless of their accessibility capabilities, meaning people with various type of handicaps need to be connected and people need to be connected also in their native languages and therefore they will be then able to develop sets of uh, knowledge sharing. We are now in the information society. Our ultimate goal is the knowledge society where everyone has not only access to information but can create information, use it and share it. Those are the four prerequisites for, our, for a knowledge society. And information is very is key. It's the only thing when you share it, it multiplies. Anything else is divided when you share it. So by, by a quick show of hands, how many out there think that uh, broadband is a luxury? Quick show of hands. Uh, okay, and how many out there think it's a human right? Mm. So, so how about that? Uh, you know, how, what's the perspective uh, of uh, politicians, uh, governments on broadband? Do they see it as a luxury for their people or do they see it as a human right? Uh, Hans, why don't you start? 
I think we have seen uh, quite a dramatic transformation to see that when you talk about the infrastructure in a, com in a country, it's not all about roads, uh, airports, etc. It's equally much about information technology. Uh, to have broadband, I mean, in the studies that has been done across the globe, it's clearly defined that for every 10% of broadband penetration, you get the 1% sustainable GDP. But you only get that, of course, if you use the broadband and getting applications and services that is driving GDP growth. Everything from a digital agenda from a government when it comes to e-health, mobile health, or if it's uh, uh, mobile uh, education or digital education. And here I see more and more governments thinking about connecting the private sector investment in broadband, broadband and having targets for the country when it comes to digital usage, uh, everything from digital education, digital healthcare. Of course, we are in the infancy. And remember, we are in an inflection point in the industry. We are just past 1 billion mobile broadband uh, users, meaning they have 3G or higher speeds. And think about that it's going to be 5 billion just five years from now. That's going to make a tremendous change for how many have access to internet and can actually access the information. I mean, it sounds like governments, because uh, they see a direct benefit, 10% uh, penetration, 1% growth in GDP. But I've looked at the Broadband Commission global map, and there are, are huge swaths of, of like the Af you know, African continent that it's not penetrating at all. So how am I doing? What, what, I mean, when you're, when you're out there, when you're talking to people, are you hearing, are you hearing that they understand that benefit? In every country today in the world, they do understand that access to broadband or access to internet is no longer a, a luxury. This is a basic human need. That's a, the term we use because it's a basic human need because this will be the key tool for transformation, transformation of people's lives. Uh, you will not foresee, you will not see today any government that does not think that having a national broadband plan will be key for their social and economic development. Today we have about 112 countries that are a national broadband plan that, that are coordinating together and we hope that the remaining um, uh, 90 or so countries will also have the national broadband plan by, by 2015 so that they link broadband to the Millennium Development Goals. As you know, there, are set, there is a set of eight million development goals from elimination of poverty to uh, uh, partnership arrangements, uh, to education, to uh, access to safe water, drinking water, and other things like that. We are linking broadband to all of these. Are there any countries that, that stand out that, are, that don't? I mean, you just said, it sounds like you said everybody gets it, but I can't imagine that. So it seems, you know, I mean, there's a lot of polit political and social strife out there. I mean, I mean that's really? It's a very good question because you gave the example of Africa. Let me tell you what happened in the mobile, the mobile miracle that happened in Africa. There, there's been, the, the, 10 years ago, the mobile penetration in Africa was less than 0.5%. Today, it's uh, over 70% penetration. You have some new services and applications that were conceived, designed, and implemented, implemented in Africa. The mobile banking, you, I'm sure Absolutely. many of, them, of you have heard about the M-Banking, the M-Pesa banking in Kenya and, and, and Uganda. This was an African pro solution to an African problem. Some people who wanted to, to transfer little amounts of money, $5, $10, for which the current banking system is not fit for. They came with that idea of having it through mobile phones. And today, mobile banking is a universal thing. And, and Hans, you know, it seems to me that, that the real revolution has come through mobile broadband. It's not the like basic broadband. So, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Like what, what was the turning point and even just the, the fundamental infrastructure differences that allow mobile broadband to sort of move so quickly? I think two things. Mobile broadband, of course, uh, from a deployment point of view, is much quicker and much more efficient. Second is the phone that you're holding in your hands in this room, the smartphone. <laughs> Uh, tremendous change of behavior. I mean, I'll give you two stats. One is, if you had a feature for phone for three years ago, 90% of the time you spent on the phone was to calling a friend or an office or a colleague. 
if you have a smartphone today, 75% of the time you spend on the phone is not to call anyone, is to do anything else, checking your Twitter account, mail, etc. You are already transformed. And it's only 15%, 15, 15, 1,5% of the mobile subscribers in the world that has a smartphone so far. And then you can say two things. Fantastic, 15% already have a phone. Or you can say, wow, 85% to go. And I think that's what we need to discuss. And I think what is more important is that when the technology rolls out right now, I mean, we know that it's going to be 3G coverage. And what is fantastic with telecommunication is that there's no boundaries between countries. You can take a phone and it moves in between because we use the same technology. 1.6 billion phones made every year basically on the same technology brings down the cost. That means that we can, for every 10, 20 dollars a smartphone goes down in price, hundreds of millions of people have a chance to get a smartphone. And that will continue with the more slow, but the most important is when you get that enabler, that mobile broadband being out there, what can you do with it? And Hamadun talked about innovation starts when you get it in hand. So Hamadun, uh, you know, uh, here, we've got uh, uh, the rollout of 4G, LTE, all over the place. Yes. Uh, but I know that uh, companies like Nokia, for example, sell quite a few feature phones still, uh, still 2G phones, certainly 3G phones. Do you see that as problematic that you know, one part of the world is sort of eating uh, broadband in sort of a different way, digesting it much more quickly and has better access and better tools? Or do you worry about the kinds of tools that are being sold into uh, third world and developing countries? No, we're making sure that everyone comes on board with the top of the uh, technology today. It can be done. Cost of uh, terminal equipment is going down. Cost of connectivity is going down. What we need is to make sure that governments understand their role, which is to put the right environment, the policy and the regulatory environment that is conducive to business for private sector. Private sector will come in and roll out the network. And then the, the governments should also ensure that uh, they have a, an attractive taxing policy that is not taxing ICT and telecommunication uh, infrastructure and services as well. And the third element will be important to create the necessary tools, those services and applications. Governments and private sector will have complementary roles, one which will be to, to put the legal and regulatory framework. And then back again, private sector will, will lay out the, the infrastructure. Government will also create some national e-government services, e-learning, e-education, uh, e-health services that will trigger the demand again. So it's, it's, the all, overall thing is very much complementary. And we, at the end, in the International Telecommunication Union, it's our job to ensure that government and private sector understand those complementary roles and they play it safe. So we were talking about broadband as sort of a, 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 an engine for social change. But when somebody gets a smartphone, and you talked about this, they don't make phone calls, obviously. They, they use a lot of data. They spend time using the, the capabilities of the phone. How do we educate people, or is there any concern about people getting these phones and basically spending all their time downloading or watching YouTube videos? <laughs> Might be good as well for education reasons. <laughs> now, Depends I think, on the video. Yeah, yeah, but I think that uh, what we see is, of course, that uh, I mean, many of us have gone through the black and white TV, and then you got a computer, and you move on to a feature phone and a laptop, and then you got a smartphone. And uh, with a certain degree, then you lim limit your uh, innovation and imagination. If you start at the end and you get the smartphone for the first time and you have not gone through the black and white and TV and all, everything, it's evident that you can do so much more with it. And that's what we see in, in many markets where you get starting with the broadband and the interconnection that you actually start by maybe, I mean, I've been part of it myself, coming to a rural village somewhere, getting connectivity. The first thing they do, they put, go into Google and they Google on their, own, on their own village to know about what have they written about us and what have they written about the next village. And then they start to interconnect and getting information. So it's a lot about information and, of course, sharing, but efficiency. Efficiency is where suddenly a fisherman or anyone can actually start doing business by using the phone instead of traveling hours to get the possibility to sell the fish or something like that. So the innovation is enormous and it creates economical development. 
but also if we in private and public partnership uh, and this type of gatherings bring out the strength of using the technology to find the enablers. And you heard before that the hackathon is, uh, is going down in Tribeca where they are now having a lot of people using the network, uh, the at t network, to come up with innovation on education. New applications, apps for education, that can be rolled out anywhere in the world because mobility and the in internet is without boundaries. So, so Hamadoun, do, do you think it's important when they do get access to these devices to provide a certain level of education, especially in the case of social media? Social media uh, is so powerful on these devices and it's obviously been an agent of change, uh, you know, Arab Spring, things like that. So do you uh, or are there, have you seen programs where like here's the phone, let's set you up on Twitter or let's set you up on, on one of the, the local social networks or let's set you up on a, a micro social network that's more about your, your area. So what, what have you seen in that? Hans talked about uh, black and white TV. That's where I, I really feel old guy here because I'm sure many people in this room have never <laughs> looked at a black and white TV. You know, this technology is not about technology for technology's sake. It's about what you do with it. So it's a set of, of applications and services that will come with it. The education part, the health part, and uh, how you make uh, technology for good because uh, I mean some of the aspects of course uh, of technology needs to be also uh, uh, we need to caution people about uh, the dangers in the cyberspace the cyber security part is also a very crucial element in which uh, on which we are working in the ITU but we also make sure that uh, we not only involve uh, the users but also the service providers and others uh, so the ultimate goal if what you want to achieve, what you want to do with technology. And, and this is why we are recommending to governments to ensure that they are not taxing this tool that is helpful for, to develop other sectors as well, be it on economy, tourism, uh, education, or health. I mean, those elderly who will have a, a much more independent life they, uh, give, uh, thanks to technology you know, need not to pay uh, ex to ex extra for having access to that. Uh, a handicapped person who will use technology uh, to make his life easier and be more independent should not be paying uh, extra for that. Those are the key issues that we need to uh, look at here. So in, in some of these developing nations where they're getting access to broadband, uh, are you seeing, for example, examples of them uh, getting uh, sort of remote health care through the devices? And how does that work? Definitely. And I think the biggest challenge we have is that it's not a lack of innovation to finding uh, mobile health care, mobile education. It's more the biggest challenge to scale, to scale it, to bring it to more people to get it out. I mean, innovation is, is enormous. Uh, and I think uh, part of what we do in the Broadband Commission, uh, in other public-private discussion, is to find that scale, to see that we can scale these type of solutions. Uh, and I think this audience here, I mean, everybody on this Social Goods Summit, uh, is of course extremely important to replicate and talk about what we can do together when it comes to application, on, et cetera. So I think it's not lack of innovation and applications coming up. It's more, can we scale them and being efficient in many countries, in many places at the same time? As, uh, efficient. And, and this is why we're launching the tweet campaign today, Absolutely. actually. You know, be more broadband. Be more, more broadband. Yeah. So do you want to mention that a little bit? Yeah, we, we're making sure that those of you who are connected are sending a tweet on broadband or SGS Global uh, to make sure that you are sponsoring one person who isn't connected in the world. So to, to bring this issue uh, to the whole world so that everybody knows that uh, we're fortunate to be among the billion people who are connected to broadband today, but there are still six more billion people that need to be connected to broadband. And this is something that you, the young generation, can do. So we just need six, we need six billion people, or we need three billion people maybe to add up of trending this term right now. And Hans mentioned yeah. we're, we're going to have 50 billion devices right. that yeah. are connected as well. So in fact, we're going beyond people. 
We're talking about Internet of Things here. Our yeah. forecast is by 2020, 50 billion connected devices. 50 billion connected devices. Do, does anything have to change on the device side as far as manufacturers, pricing, distribution to make that happen? To ex or can anything happen to accelerate it? The most important, I would say, and now I'm going to be techie, <laughs> <laughs> is that we keep the standardization. We use the same technologies across the globe. So we get the global scale of, scale of technology. And so far, we have been good on that. If not, we wouldn't have 6.3 billion mobile subscriptions. Right. So if we continue using that, then you can bring down the cost even further, especially on the mobile broadband devices like 3G or 4G devices, because the more usage, the price will go down. So We are publishing tomorrow and we are handing the first copy to the UN Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, tomorrow at the Yale Club. We will launch this uh, publication on the state of broadband globally. Uh, uh, and there are a set of 12 recommendations at the end of that. One, of course, is to make sure a spectrum is available. Mm. You know, and that's the duty of my organization to allocate spectrum and frequencies for different services and allocation, and we do that very successfully. Uh, second, uh, very important issue is uh, governments to, uh, to put in place some of the policies that we call the dig once only uh, solutions. Wh whenever, whenever you are uh, digging a road for, a, for construction of a road, a pipeline or a gas, gas line, you have to put fiber along the side of that that, uh, that will give you at a much better cost. I'm just saving. curious, is that, is that happening? That, that's happening. That's, we've, that been, we've been advocating this uh, in many countries. So now we want to make sure that it's taken into account globally. It's just like when you're building a, 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 a house, you make sure that you are putting the necessary uh, cabling in there, not only for electricity, but for right. telephone and, and internet connection and as well. I, and I guess unlike uh, maybe in the US where everybody has to kind of shake hands or agree, or can I borrow your line, can I run something on here? Uh, some of this infrastructure is being built for the first time, so it's a good opportunity to put yeah. the best of the Correct. best. And, and, and obviously the recommendation is, absolutely fiber because it has the most bandwidth and is going to sort of extend out. You know, we were talking a little bit about, without getting too technical, difference between 3G and 4G mm. and, you know, I guess you would recommend that, that these, these countries as they're building out, I mean, I would assume that you recommend they build out 4G or am I wrong about that? Yeah, you probably are. I'm probably wrong about that. <laughs> no, because again, it's about the whole ecosystem. And uh, uh, remember now that we probably are, we are adding 140, 150 million subscribers per quarter in the world. The majority is still coming on 2D and 3D. So the ecosystem is on phones that are 3D. So the price is so much lower. So if you start with a 4G in, in lot, let's say, a country where you have low, uh, low penetration, the, the cost for the handset will be too expensive. So I would probably say that you, we, we are building networks that can handle 3G and 4G in the, in the future, but 3G still in many of these countries will be the predominant mobile broadband access. And our prediction is 2017, 85% of the, uh, of the population on Earth will have 3G coverage, meaning they have, will have mobile broadband. And of course, that's driven of the, the reason that the technology and the handsets will come down in price. Then, of course, 4G will come and it's more efficient. The most important with 4G, of course, the speed is higher, is the latency. The real-time latency, how quick you can get the information back and forth from the internet, is a huge difference. And, and one thing we haven't talked about, you know, as part of the infrastructure, is electricity. I mean, if they're using, for example, if they go from a 3G or a 4G device, they're going to need more power. They're going to have to recharge more often. But how much access do they have to power out there? I mean, is that, is that one of the larger hurdles? How much is that? Yeah, well, access to power is, is a key element. What we see now is the reverse uh, uh, solution, in fact. Uh, because of the uh, need to access telephone, people are bringing electricity. Yeah. And that's what is happening. But of course, with the digitalization of the, the broadcasting uh, uh, equipment uh, by 2015, we see a lot of saving in terms of energy. I mean, the energy consumption will be actually 40% uh, 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 less than it is today. So therefore, there is a lot of saving in that. We have standardized uh, two years ago uh, the univer universal charger so that uh, when you buy a mobile terminal, you can use the same, the same uh, uh, charger. 
uh, in the past for every type of, every generation of equipment, even from the same manufacturer, you will have different uh, chargers, and which is not ac acceptable, and which is uh, uh, actually consuming a lot in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, we are saving a lot. More than 10 million tons of uh, CO2 will be saved if everybody adopts the universal chargers, and we, have, we see many big manufacturers doing so. Uh, we are also making sure that uh, uh, the uh, LTE standard also DPC was approved this year in January at our World uh, Radio Conference is also adopted by all countries, which means what Hans just said, not only high speed, but of low latency and a much uh, bigger saving in terms of bandwidth as well, because we need to take all these things in, into account. So I know that uh, that report is dropping tomorrow, but I'm wondering if one of you or both of you could tell me the most surprising finding in the, the state of broadband report. Like, what what is what would raise eyebrows? Well, what you you, are, you first ask is no longer a luxury. So it's no longer a luxury. That's we see that this is a fundamental uh, tool that is accepted by everyone. And the the other thing that we can say is that. No one knows what's going to happen tomorrow. We have, we, we've seen, we have not invented even one millionth of uh, the capabilities. This, is, this thing is driven by human brain. And you know, this is one natural resource that is equally distributed everywhere in the world. And it's very powerful. And we haven't used a, even an inch of it yet. So, so Hans, what, what is, I mean, what's, what's next? What is, what is the thing that's, that's coming down the pike for, for global broadband expansion? I think that uh, we have started to see in how we as users, consumers are transformed by using mobility, broadband, and the cloud. I think what we're gonna see in the next step is enterprises. Uh, and let me just give an example. Think about an enterprise looking into using mobility, broadband, and the cloud. They would look for business efficiency, consumer insights, and they will also look for a new business model. Give you one good example. Spotify is a music service that you probably have heard of. So it's probably 100 times cheaper to, to distribute music digital than buying a CD or printing it. So they find that by using mobility broadband and the cloud. They get consumer insights. They know what you and I are listening, so they can tell you what we should listen more to, what more songs we should add, what friends are listening the same. Fantastic, they have that consumer insight, data mining. And finally, they change the business model. From buying the song, we are now sort of subscribing to the song. So that's what we're gonna see from enterprises, using mobility broadband and the cloud to find efficiency, consumer insights, and changing business models. And that would go for any industry, transport, medical, etc. And I have the luxury into meeting many of them, sitting, thinking about how can I use the mobility broadband and the cloud to be more efficient. And of course, all that efficiency will lead to growth, employment, but not only that, it will address some of the challenges with CO2 emission, etc. So I think that's what I'm seeing right now, an enormous focus from any industry, and that's why I think we need to speak out more. What can the technology do? And especially the, which, uh, what Hans says now, I will add to that the fact that uh, the cost of terminals will be much lower yes. because the computing and the storage is done elsewhere in the cloud, and therefore the access terminals will be uh, much cheaper. Now, if cost of uh, access is also brought down uh, with sharing, I mean, the, we will have more people able, being able to afford it because affordability is a key. In the 49 least developed countries that are listed in, by the United Nations, are least developed countries, the cost of broadband is higher than a monthly income of a citizen. That needs to stop. We need to make sure that every citizen of this planet has access to the means uh, of uh, ICT no matter what their circumstances or no matter where they are born. All right, well, thank you very, both of you, uh, Hans and Hamadoun, thank you so much for your time and thank you for your work on the expansion of global broadband and uh, thank you all for listening. But please, don't forget, don't forget to tweet. <laughs> no, don't please. forget to tweet. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.